You might notice that we have a number for the Bible class. We started meeting again this morning. There were 10 of us in attendance. Back, oh, in the 60s, early 70s, one of the largest congregations in the Churches of Christ was in Madison, Tennessee, and Batsel Barrett Baxter was the minister there. He wrote a little book that said, As Goes the Sunday School, So Goes the Church. So we would love to invite you to be part of that. We're studying from the book of Acts, and we got a good start this morning, but we'll have a better continuation if you come and be with us at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. When I first started preaching, an older preacher told me, he said, beware, death comes in threes. Have you ever heard that? And oddly enough, it has turned out that way quite a number of times uh, as I've been in ministry. I'll do a funeral and it won't be but a few days that I'll hear that I've got another one and then sometime not too long after that I'll hear that somebody else has passed. And so for some reason, death comes in threes, but so do good stuff. Uh, Lots of good things come in threes. There's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's about as good as it gets. But there are also others mentioned in Scripture in in threes that you would recognize. How about Peter, James, and John, the big three that always were with Jesus? They got to see things and do things with Jesus that the other nine did not get to do. Moses and Aaron and Miriam, brothers and a sister that helped lead the children of Israel up out of Egypt. And then today we're going to talk about a trio that we don't usually Uh, immediately come to mind, but that's Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist. If you don't have John the Baptist, the gospel is just different. Uh, In the gospel of Mark, he says, this is the introduction to the ministry of Jesus Christ, John. He just starts with John the Baptist. Most of them start with John as a grown-up, but Luke gives us an account of John the Baptist's birth. So if you want to go over to Luke chapter 1, we're going to be reading some passages there. A short one to begin with and then a fairly lengthy one here in just a minute. Luke chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 5. In the time of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Let me give you a pop quiz. Y'all are church folks. You probably know the answer to this one. You've got a, a woman who is upright and blameless married to a man who is upright and blameless. They're both from priestly descent, and she's barren. What's about to happen? (laughs) God's going to fix it, right? You go back to the Old Testament, and you just find them just lined up one right after another. Sarah was barren until she was 90 years old and had Isaac. Rachel, who was Jacob's favorite wife, was barren until she had Joseph. Hannah was barren, begged the Lord for a baby. She said, if you'll just give me a child, I'll give him back to you and he'll serve you in your temple. And sure enough, God answered his prayer and gave her Samuel. I'm sorry, Samson. No, Samuel, I was right the first time. Gave her Samuel. So when you see that Elizabeth is barren, your first thought's got to be, here we go, right? God's going to do something amazing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the information. That preamble always is followed by God does something amazing. So when you're looking at the life of John the Baptist, you have to start with Zechariah and Elizabeth. You have to start with a couple who set the framework first, who were there living an entire life, waiting, hoping, longing for a child, but never having one until God saw that the time was right. All of Israel, everybody they knew, all of their lives had been thinking about this person, this forerunner of the Christ, this one that was going to come and make straight pathways for the Lord. Everybody they knew had been thinking about that, had been praying about that, had been wanting that all of their lives. And this barren woman who was getting up in age is going to be the answer 
that God uses for their prayers. All right, let's read the long passage now. We're going to start in verse 8 and get a good look at how God goes about bringing this to pass. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as the priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his birth. Many of the people of Israel will be, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you the good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When the time of his service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and has taken away my disgrace from among the people. So I want to take a look at what we can learn, what we ought to remember about all three of these. We're going to talk first about Zechariah, then we're going to talk about Elizabeth, and then we'll talk just briefly about John the Baptist, and then next week we'll pick up and talk about him just a little bit more. So what do we need to remember about Zechariah? When, when somebody says, uh, do you know anything about the birth of John the Baptist, most people remember that Zechariah didn't believe what Gabriel told him. Most people remember that he was stricken dumb, right? So for, give or take, 10 months, he's not going to be able to speak. He finishes up his work at the temple. They had traveled from their own hometown to Jerusalem so that he could work at the temple during that time. He had been given the job to take care of the altar of burnt incense, which, by the way, was right next to the curtain. There was that giant, heavy curtain that blocked your way from the holy place into the most holy place. But John the Baptist's daddy was within about 15 feet of the Ark of the Covenant or where the Ark of the Covenant should have been. He was right next to the Holy of Holies. He was working on a job that God had for him to do in behalf of the people of Israel. So what should we remember about him? We should remember that he was chosen by God. Out of all the Jewish people that God might have chosen to be the father of John the Baptist, he chose Zechariah. So while we're thinking about he didn't quite believe what Gabriel told him and he was dumb for several months, throw that in. God chose him as an individual to be in charge of helping to raise John the Baptist. He met Gabriel face to face. The Hebrew writer tells us that we ought to entertain strangers because we never know if we're entertaining an angel without knowing it. Never have understood that passage completely, but I love it, right? What the, the, pop, the possibility that maybe somebody that we do something kind for was on a mission for God himself. Love that idea. Zechariah didn't have to worry about that. Zechariah saw an angel. He saw Gabriel, the angel. What's Gabriel famous for? We talk about him in songs, right? Gabriel, blow your horn. People are talking about when when the Lord comes back, the horn will sound, right? The trumpet will sound, and many believe that it will be 
Gabriel who blows it. He's also the one who goes to Mary to tell Mary that she's going to be the mother of Jesus. Right? This is an important, this isn't just any old angel, if there is such a thing. This is Gabriel. This is Gabriel. He says, I stand in the presence of God. I brought you a message straight from the throne room of God. And all of this happened while he was kind of minding his own business, being a servant to the people of God. He had gone in there to keep the incense burning. In the law, it was said, you must never, ever let the incense go out. So it was his job to make sure that that law was kept on behalf of the people. And you might also notice that he had people. He went in and was serving inside the temple. But there were people waiting on him outside the temple. We don't know whether this is just random folks who are at the temple that day and it was the time for somebody to go in and take care of the altar of incense. So they were waiting you know, to see how things went. Uh, like a spectators, a crowd had gathered because one of the priests was going into the holy place. Or maybe... He had other priests and other priestly families that were friends. And they waited outside because they wanted to be with him after he had been inside the holy place. What an experience would that be? You've got a friend who is talking to you and it's just you know normal banter. And then he goes inside the temple into that holy place where only certain priests were allowed to go. And when he comes back out, what a wonderful experience to share with people that care about you, who want to hear about your experience. And when he gets back out, he can't share. So he's doing some kind of interesting pantomime. He's trying to, you know, to, you know two words, two words, you know, ang or two syllables, angel. Uh, you know, he's trying to get that figured out for them. I don't know exactly how they all came to the understanding, but they knew something big had happened while he was inside the temple. All right, what should we remember about Elizabeth? She's going to be helping to raise the forerunner of Jesus. And that's no small thing. And in their culture, a great deal of the emphasis on raising children was on the mother. So Elizabeth would have spent a great deal of time with this little boy as he's growing up, knowing that he's not normal. John is not a normal child. When an angel tells your daddy that you cannot have any strong drink before you're ever conceived, right, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John and he can never have strong drink. You're not normal. You can't have wine. You can't have anything that comes from the grape vineyard. You can't have a grape off the vine. You can't have the fermented you can't have wine of any kind. The word there is oinos, and it can mean anything from you just pulled the grape all the way to the most fermented wine you can imagine. It's that whole spectrum. He could have none of that. A lot of scholars think, although the scripture doesn't specifically say it, that John the Baptist was a Nazarite. Now, Nazarites had three things that they could never do. One was you could never have strong drink. That one Gabriel mentions. The second one is you could never be around dead bodies. Right? So if you have a, a relative that passes away, you can't go to the funeral. You're, you're different. You're separate. And the third one is you never cut your hair. Right? So that's the one we remember from Samson. We know that Samuel was a lifetime Nazarite. Uh, Samson was a lifetime Nazarite. And we think maybe John the Baptist was as well. But be that as it may, this boy was different. The things that his friends were doing growing up were not for him. He was kept with the understanding that he had a mission to perform as he grew up. And then the thing that I think we need to remember, and, and it strikes me the most perhaps, is the way that Elizabeth approached her pregnancy. When she found out that she was pregnant, she secluded herself for five months. 
In other words, she didn't hang around with all of her friends. She didn't immediately announce that she was pregnant. And there may be a lot of different reasons for that. It may be that she was concerned, maybe like her husband, that it was kind of late in life and maybe this wasn't going to happen. But she wanted to make sure before she let everybody in on the secret that she was far enough along that she was confident and that maybe she was able to prove it to some small degree. Uh, For the last several years, I've been working with college age people. And on a lot of different occasions, a little girl would come to me and she'd say, I think I'm pregnant. Don't tell anybody. And some of them told me don't tell anybody because they were terrified. They weren't really happy about it. They didn't really want to be. Just recently, I had a young lady come to me that we love dearly. She pulled me aside in the foyer and she said, I think I may be pregnant. And I said, well, are we telling people? And she said, no, we're not telling people yet. So a few weeks later, she had seen her doctor. They had a sonogram. And she said, now we're telling people. So we're excitedly waiting on uh, that baby to be born here in a few months. And it's, it's an exciting time in life. But when you're an older woman, and by the way, did you notice, at least the way it's translated, Zachariah says, I'm an old man and my wife is along in years. He doesn't use the O word when he talks about his wife. He's, so that's another thing we should remember. Zechariah was a smart guy. But she was blessed without bragging. She kept the news to herself for five months. And I went and looked up some stats. And uh, These may be interesting to you, maybe not, but I, I thought they were. Uh, women who conceive under the age of 35 have about a 15% chance of miscarriage. Between 35 and 45, that number jumps to 35%. And if you're over 45, it's a 50-50. So she was perhaps concerned, perhaps excited, but for whatever reason, she waited. And her waiting gives us a connection to the birth of Jesus. It says that she put herself in seclusion for five months and then the, the next Uh, passage begins the birth narrative of Jesus. Chapter 1 verse 26 says, in the sixth month God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So we're in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy when Mary finds out that she's going to be the mother of the Lord. Mary also chooses seclusion. She doesn't stay in Nazareth. She leaves Nazareth and goes to visit with her aunt. The angel tells her the reason that you can believe that you really are going to be pregnant without ever having been with a man is that God can do anything. And the example is Elizabeth. She's already pregnant, the one who's past bearing years. And Mary goes to see Elizabeth. And that brings us to John the Baptist. When Mary enters the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist is about six months gestation. He is already fully formed, probably somewhere near being viable outside the womb. He is probably an active child. Elizabeth knows he's there. And when Jesus enters the room in the womb of Mary, it says that John began to turn over in Elizabeth's womb. He got so excited that Jesus, the Savior, Messiah, teeny tiny baby in the womb, Jesus was in the room, that John the Baptist in the womb began to celebrate. And both Mary and Elizabeth pray beautiful prayers of how God is using them to change the world. When Becky and I were first married, we'd been married, oh, I don't know how 
many months before we found out, about three or four months before we found out that we were pregnant with Beth. And I was working with a congregation in Forney, Texas. Anybody know anything about Forney Jackrabbits? No? Yeah? Okay. We were in Forney, and I was leading singing at that time. And every time I would stand up and say, let's turn to number 418, Beth would start doing a jig. And it, Beth, Becky had two choices. She could leave the auditorium or get sick right there. So we know babies respond, right? They get excited when they hear voices. Uh, if you play uh, music for the baby in the womb, it's a good thing. Read to the baby in the womb, it's a good thing. Have Jesus show up at your house. This is a great thing. John is just celebrating because the Savior of the world has come into the presence of his mother and he in their home. It'll be another 30 years before John gets to do his job. But Lord willing, next week we'll talk about some of the difficult things that came his way not by his choice necessarily, but because God said so. Right? You're going to have a son. His name's going to be John. He's going to be a special kind of person. And he's going to be the one to call the Israelites back to their God so that their Savior can come and bring them the good news. So we'll talk next week, Lord willing, about some of those things. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we love you. We love the way you do things. We love the power that's at work in our world and the things that you did through Zechariah and Elizabeth, through Mary, to bring forth the chosen one, the, the Messiah, the one who would give us our hope, who would give us our salvation. And all of these things you knew from before the beginnings of the world. You, you had it all planned out. You knew everything that had to happen. And Father, we praise you and we glorify you for being such an amazing God. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. If there's a way that we can help you or encourage you by way of a public response, we'd love to do that as we sing.